All right, all right, everybody. Welcome to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. Talking tonight about mitigating medical mishaps. Uh, I am a co-owner with my partner, Greg, of Optometric Education Consultants, and we do this because we enjoy the creative outlet of sharing our experience and educating our colleagues. I work at a large medical surgical uh, facility called Center for Sight under the umbrella of USI. I live in Sarasota, Florida, and we I practice uh, in Venice uh, in, this, uh, in this practice. I used to be at Nova for 28 years and two days, and I uh, left academia several years ago with my wife, and we're enjoying uh, the private practice. Now, disclosures, all, all has been mitigated. There are no products, diseases, or, or, or much being, uh, being discussed here. So everything has been mitigated. I do work for, I do consult and speak for Bausch & Lomb. That's really, really pretty, pretty much it for me. But important, uh, and Greg, everything, you can see everything and hear everything all right? Yes, sir. You're doing well. Very good. All right. I do have another disclosure, which I think is is actually very important. Nothing I'm going to talk about during this lecture should be remotely construed as being fair or reasonable. So let's look at some cat, some common preventable causes of catastrophic patient injury, things that we need to be be aware of. Talked about these before. We're going to go only briefly. I'm going to share some things with you. Misdiagnoses and malfeasance, giant cell arteritis is a condition that is so varied there, unfortunately, medical legally, there is plenty of blame to go around. I, I'm going to talk about my experience uh, in the medical legal arena as an expert witness. I've probably done over 100 cases. Off the top of my head, I can think of four cases that involve giant cell arteritis. One of them is being an, is an active case I'm doing right now. Posterior vitreous detachment with subsequent retinal detachment, just because a patient develops a retinal detachment doesn't mean the optometrist should necessarily be sued, but unfortunately, in many cases, they will be. Infectious keratitis. Sometimes we run into issues because it's a fair to ask, not what is it, but what else can it be? And we have to balance the time needed for treatment to be successful versus going too long. And optic atrophy is a term that's used very cavalierly. If you write in your chart, uh, disc pallor, you should have ex explanation for that. And certainly if you write optic atrophy, you really need to have an explanation for that. And also the eye not correctable to 2020, you should always investigate. When patients still have symptoms, run it down, do a little bit extra. 74-year-old male presents with the worst headache of his life. He goes to an emergency room uh, associated with a Veterans Administration Hospital. Over a three-week period, he sees a physician assistant, an emergency department physician, cardiologist, a nurse practitioner, three optometrists. Now, the very, the very first uh, visit was a PA who is being supervised by the ER physician. His history included eye ache, jaw pain, scalp pain, facial pain, somnolence, uh, malaise. He would fall asleep while eating his food and jaw claudication. At the very first visit, the PA diagnosed temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, which I don't think uh, accounts for the worst headache of one's life and was put on an NSAID, and the ER physician, I guess, concurred. He comes back sometime later, they find a tick on him. Now he's diagnosed with Lyme disease. Now, going through the records, is written, vasculitis such as temporal artery is highly unlikely, not GCA. However, said rate and CRP were ordered. They came back elevated, but there's no indication that the results were ever reviewed. Ultimately, an optometrist makes a diagnosis of temporal arteritis, actually fetches the steroids uh, for him herself. Unfortunately, he went bilaterally blind. 72-year-old female presents six-week history of scalp pain, fatigue, weight loss, 
and transient ischemic attacks in the right eye with complete loss of temporary loss of vision. Goes to an optometrist with sudden vision loss in the right eye, findings that at that time right eye has no light perception, left eye is 20-20, diagnosis papilledema of the right eye, typically a bilateral phenomenon, plan referred to ophthalmology the next day, next day patient goes to ophthalmology, is now no light perception in each eye from a bilateral arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. 68-year-old female, one-month history, sore throat, cough, ear pain, all unresponsive to antibiotics. Suddenly loses vision in her right eye, gets into a neurologist who diagnoses a Horner syndrome. That doesn't explain the vision, lo the vision loss. Neurologist sends the ophthalmology who diagnoses a central retinal artery occlusion, and that was it. You know, said there's nothing that can be done at this time. No workup, no evaluation was made. A month later, patient suddenly loses vision in the other eye. At this point, a good history saw that six weeks prior to the initial visit, the patient was not eating because of pain while chewing. Now he has no light perception left eye, he has an arteritic ischemic neuropathy, pupil involved, third nerve palsy, ocular hypotony, Horner syndrome, old artery occlusion, said right was 114. The biopsy was positive. Steroids were started immediately. Symptoms uh, almost immediately abated, but had no visual recovery. 78-year-old female, one-week history, occipital and jaw pain. Family practitioner treats her with NSAIDs. Two days later, she has one hour of total vision loss, each eye completely blind. Right eye recovered, left eye did not. Family practitioner discontinued the NSAIDs, referred immediately to ophthalmology. In triage, ophthalmology says, it sounds like an NSAID reaction. Wait a week for them to wear off before you come in. Next day, patient is now no light perception in the remaining eye with a said rate of 117. So one thing you, we always need to remember to mitigate the medical mishap, you should be able to say this to yourself or think this every day. Any acute vision loss in the elderly is giant cell until proven otherwise. Now, of course, it can be other things. But vision loss, acuity loss, visual field loss, any acute vision loss in the elderly is GCA. And by definition, Elderly is 50 and above. It's not my not my not my determination. I can guarantee that if you pull up any any manuscript in the peer review literature right now on giant cell arteritis, temporal arteritis, arteritic ischemic neuropathy, I can guarantee you in the first sentence of the introduction, it's going to say it is an autoimmune vasculitis afflicting patients over the age of 50. So anybody over the age of 50, this is always now on the menu. Great. This brings me to polling question number one. Are we good for it? Yes, we are. I'm going to go to polls. I'm going All to right. So which question. is worse in patient management? To be wrong or to be negligent? Or they both seem pretty bad to me. So if you don't see the polling question on your screen there, you see chats, you'll see polls. Uh, it should be popping up and you can re reply with your answer. Right hand of the screen, chat, polls, course notes, survey. I see people have found it. Polls are rolling in. So which is worse than patient management? To be wrong, to be negligent, they both seem pretty bad to me. Joe, the polls are rolling in nicely. Nothing has really happened. Other few people had a few questions about the new platform, so I took care of those. Don't worry about it. Me too. <laughs> All right. So I'll display. 
so people can see. And uh, what we have is two uh, percent or one person. Joe says to be wrong. We have seventeen responses or about thirty nine percent that are saying to be negligent, and fifty eight percent have said they both seem pretty bad to me. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, they 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 both are pretty bad. But in the medical legal arena, what they are looking for is the word negligent, negligent or below standard of care. If you had to be one or the other, it's better to be wrong than to be negligent. Now, what I mean to be wrong is you might assess something incorrectly. Your diagnosis may be wrong. Your treatment may be right for the wrong diagnosis, but you're wrong. That does happen. It's when you don't do something that some a, another prudent practitioner would would do. So what they're looking for is is negligence. I, I don't want to say it's okay to be wrong, but it's better to be wrong and be very clear as to what your thoughts are. Here's a case that could have gone actually fairly badly for me. This was a 78 year old female I saw in practice. You know, patient I've seen before. For a routine comprehensive examination, there was nothing untoward about it, but she did mention that she had some intermittent right scalp pain. Doesn't happen every day, happens in the morning, generally dissipates. Even half of the day I saw her, already dissipated, wasn't really bothering her. Her exam was completely normal. I actually wrote in the chart, doubt GCA or disaster, but I will obtain the serology. Turns out I get the serology, I ordered the test. Said rate comes back at 68. CRP is over 16, should only be half of that. Contacted her PCP, told her PCP was going on. We put the patient on 80 milligrams of prednisone, referred to rheumatology. Ultimately, I got a temporal artery ultrasound, which was negative, but it doesn't really mitigate against her not having the disease. So an important thing to remember is giant cell arteritis is the most common cr uh, chronic adult vasculitis. A lot of these patients have a premonitory condition called polymyalgia or rheumatica. Now, had I, it, had I written this down and said doubt GCA or zoster and left it and something happened untoward, uh, I would have been wrong but not necessarily negligent because I was thinking about it. It was in the differential, but based upon my assessment of the case, it was a very low likelihood. 70, and this is actually a case uh, that I'm working on. This is one of, I think I've got three or four active cases right now. Uh, one I, I haven't even looked at, I just downloaded the file. Uh, maybe one case is, is a is a personal injury, but three are malpractice. But one one active case I'm doing right now defending is uh, an optometrist who allegedly missed uh, temporal arteritis. Patient complained of vision loss in the right eye, but the patient was 2020. Well, actually, to be honest with you, the patient was a monovision patient, so the right eye was the near, and he measured the uh, acuity at J1. So that's still good vision. So a patient has symptoms, but doesn't have, uh, have signs. Pupils were reactive, discs were normal, exam normal. The patient did mention temporal pain on the right side in the history. That was not the chief complaint, but it was in the chart. Now, the optometrist assessed it, and he said he really felt it was nonspecific and it was not really uh, a, a, a factor here, but didn't record these thoughts, which I think could be helpful. I, I don't think that this person was negligent. But patient ultimately lost vision in the right, right eye only, not the left eye, from arteritic ischemic neuropathy and GCA. Now, patient did see an ophthalmologist who suspected GCA as well as a couple other zebras, that, uh, like Talosa Hunt syndrome. He wrote a note uh, for the ER, but his orders were not really carried out very urgently. Patient was admitted there's a three-day delay to diagnosis in the hospital, and a neurologist finally made the diagnosis and got the patient on treatment. <laughs> so you can see where there's probably a lot of gray zone in these cases here. But... Important to remember, giant cell arteritis is the most common chronic vasculitis in adults. 
Giant cell arteritis can be there for months, weeks, months, and sometimes even years. A lot of times this will actually burn itself out. Sometimes there are periods of exacerbation and remission. I mean, usually by the time it burns itself out, the patient can be bilaterally blind, but this is a long, this is a long-term disease. I strongly advise people lower your threshold for testing. I get the test myself. Sed rate C-reactive protein, uh, sed rate C-reactive protein and, and platelets. I send to our local lab, lab, lab core quest, doesn't have to be fasting. At least the sed rate will come back pretty quick. CRP a little bit longer. Platelets come back pretty quick. If you don't do it yourself, work with somebody who will the primary care physician. It may be reaching out and, and making a phone call or sending a letter. But if you're ever wondering what you should do, if you're wondering what should, read the chief complaint aloud and see if, you're just, if your actions are justified. If you're ever wondering, should I do this? If your chief complaint has anything like 78-year-old female comes for a routine eye exam, having some difficulty reading, sees a little bit of glare at night from headlights, is no longer driving at night because of it. Uh, also mentioned some scalp pain or, or headache. Dumb. So if you can read that, that's in the chief complaint or in the history. You, 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 you've got to explain it or do something for it. So if you're ever wondering what to do, read it aloud, read the history aloud, and see if what you're going to do is justified. If you if you choose to ignore that his, that headache in a 78-year-old or temporal pain in that 78-year-old, and it is indeed this chronic vasculitis, which costs the patient vision, it's going to be an uphill climb trying to defend if it ends up in medical malpractice. So let's change a little bit and talk about what I see as the most common issue in medical legal affairs with optometry. It's posterior vitreous detachment and retinal, det and, and retinal detachment. You know, as the patient ages, we all know the hyaluronic acid will decrease in age, with, with age. The collagen, the scaffolding of collagen fibers will lose their support aggregate. They'll form pockets of liquid vitreous, which we call lacunae, and ultimately, it, the vitreous will collapse in a vitreous detachment. As it collapses, traction is going to be exerted on, on about six areas of vitreal retinal adhesion, and a tear can result. In one old study of 589 symptomatic patients with, with floaters, those presenting with diffuse spots, about half had a retinal tear, and usually that, that is blood. Vitreal salves, 65% had a retinal tear. And if there is visible vitreal blood, about 91% have retinal tears. Now, there's varying degrees of, of vitreous blood. A little bit of hemorrhage on the Weiss ring or the back surface, like right here of the vitreous, doesn't necessarily mean there's been a tear. A lot of times that, that, that face pulls off and it tears some disc capillaries. And through gravity, some of that blood will pool down here in the mid-inferior fundus. It's when you, you have areas that you can't see the fundus because of vitreous hemorrhage that you really have to consider there is a tear there. Now, acute PVDs have about a 15% likelihood of having a tear at initial presentation. So, Already, when it comes in clean, there's an 85% chance it's going to be okay. But those that do have a tear, you know, they're, half will have more than one tear. Now, I think that we all have our own gestalt as to when we bring them back for a routine follow-up after an acute PBD. I have heard two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. I've heard, I've heard a gamut. There's no science. But I can tell you, looking at these cases, my secondhand experience, the vast majority of complications happen within the first two weeks, and many times the first week. Now, most retinal complications will occur within the first six weeks. About 3 to 5% will develop a late-onset retinal break, or maybe it was a break that was not readily visible at the time 
uh, of the first examination. But secondhand, looking at these cases, most cases I've seen usually turn bad if they're going to within one to two weeks. So if you're a four-week person, six-week person, become a one to two-week person. Now, if no complications develop within about the first six weeks, routine follow-up unless something changes. Now, there have been some papers that have come out that have said that the, the patients that progress on from an uncomplicated uh, PVD to a retinal tear and or detachment are the ones that have an increase in symptoms. The symptoms get worse. And hence, it has been advocated in, in the literature that routine follow-up is only necessary if there's an increase in symptoms. Well, not everybody's adopted this philosophy, and I don't recommend that you do either. If you bring them back for routine follow-up, you should do that. I had a series of PVDs. Some are actually hemorrhagic, uh, several in a week. And uh, I brought them back, and I looked again, and I looked again, and I didn't see a single tear. Then there was one patient who had a non-complicated, non-hemorrhagic PVD with one of my colleagues, and he wasn't available for the follow-up, so I saw the follow-up. This is a patient who came in, uncomplicated PVD, no blood, uh, no symptoms. Symptoms, all symptoms are gone. I dilated him. First thing I saw was retinal tear. And he, we needed to, we needed to get that lasered. So I still do recommend doing it, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, probably one to two weeks is the most appropriate time. Now, if you have an acute PVD with vitreous or pre-retinal hemorrhage, but you don't see a break, and I'm talking you, you may be using a Goldman fundus lens or a non-contact lens, a 90 or 78, you're definitely doing BIO, you're doing scleral depression, you, you, you consult the psychic, examine them very carefully, probably what, every one to two weeks and, and until we get through a six-week period, or, or send to a retinal specialist who whom will we'll happily take a second look and give a second opinion. Now, if no break is seen, I regular I look at them regular intervals till the till the hemorrhage clears. You know, we got to make sure it didn't tear a blood vessel. If you ever find a break, it's probably from superficial capillaries uh, on the disc when it pulls free. Now, we're talking here a small amount of inferiorly located hemorrhage and maybe a bloody Weiss's ring in the back of that vitreous face has a little bit of blood in there. Large amounts that you know of hemorrhage that obscure the fundus, and that's probably retinal tear somewhere. But please record everything that you do. This is the most important. What drops did you use? What lens that you use? That you saw the aura 360 degrees. You did scleral depression. I mean, if, if it's true, of course. And did you examine them upright or supine or both? I mean, don't put any in anything that you didn't actually do. And this is an example of one of my patients, uh, my tech. I right, discussed the effects of drops, fluoresce, tropicamide, phenylephrin, lens I use, 90 and 20, scleral depression, 360, examine upright and reclined, post your vitreous detach, also write what you didn't see. No vitreous hemorrhage, no cells. What does the periphery look like? Oh, an incidental finding. It tells we've been looking. I can say that these are not the type of records I see in medical malpractice. You want to have all of this information. The worst thing is when I'm trying to defend somebody, and I have to ask the attorney to go back and have them Tell, tell me, what, what did you do? I, I can't read the record to tell what actually happened. Drops used, lens used, and by putting 90 and 20, it pretty well implies you're doing BIO. Scleral depression, I examined them twice. I saw nothing, I saw nothing, I saw nothing. That is a hard chart to argue with. I strongly urge you to do all this, please. Here's an, an RD case I was defending. Uh, what, another one of my former students. And, you know, fortunately, Greg, I think too many of my stories began, I was defending one of my former students. Maybe I, I didn't do as, as good a job as an educator as I thought. <laughs> Complain, patient complains of floaters. 
examined by an optometrist who dilates, performed BIL, which he wrote, retina was intact, which he wrote, warned signs, symptoms, retinal detachment, he wrote this, return ASAP, any changes. Patient experiences vision reduction on a Thursday, somewhat worse on a Friday, wants to wait to see if it'll clear up, comes in Monday with a macular off retinal detachment. Now, going back to my disclosure, nothing I'm going to say should be construed as being remotely fair or reasonable. A patient cannot legally be held for their own irresponsibility. Sorry, that's just how it is legally. Well, patient sues the optometrist, and they had an expert witness uh, for the plaintiff, who's another optometrist, who opined that he felt that the optometrist fell below the standard of care. Well, during the deposition, the question was asked, well, he, he dilated, he looked with BIO, he saw nothing. Expert witness said he didn't look well enough, which I think is totally irresponsible for anybody to say about that, one of our colleagues. I go in, whenever I look at a case, I just make the assumption, whoever it is, is a reasonable optometrist, a reasonable and prudent optometrist who can do these techniques. Saying he didn't look well enough is irresponsible. Now here's a case I call snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory. There's a two-year statute of limitations where from the from an event where a malpractice case uh, suit can be filed. Now that being said, once it's filed, there's no time limit. It doesn't expire. It can go for a long time. The longest case I was ever involved in as an expert went eight years. Now this case was long even by those standards. This case was about 15 years. And what had happened was, patient presents with reduced acuity, about 2050. The optometrist diagnosed central serous choral retinopathy based upon an OCT uh, imaging, but didn't dilate to actually examine the patient. Now, this is old. OCTs are relatively new at that time. The case went to trial, and the optometrist actually prevailed. And mostly because they had a very poor expert witness for the plaintiff. And the verdict got overturned on an appeal. So they, you know, they there's a technicality. So they had to go through it all again, going back into litigation. So I was I was approached and I was asked to uh, opine and defend the optometrist. And when they sent me the record, one of the, the first things that I, I saw on the record was something, this was a representative image of an OCT that clearly shows a macula off retinal detachment. So my question was, how did you win the first time? And what they said, you know, OCT was relatively new at that time. Uh, they had a very poor expert witness. And he said, our, our expert witness, you know, pulled up, you know, they pulled up one cut on the OCT, which looked like central serous. You know, you can find a cut that looks like that. They showed the jury a picture book of OCTs of what central serous, you know, juries not being medical professionals look the same to them. They found in their favor. And this is a case I declined to be involved with because, you know, the smoking gun is right there. You know, if you're going to use technology, please, uh, please interpret the results uh, correctly. You know, we've got a famous frame. It, 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 it's the economy. Well, it's the record. And the record is the most important thing because it is a, a journal of what you've done for the patient and will be your best defense. Here's a case of what we call the missed retinal detachment. I was asked to opine as an expert witness, and I think I kind of got pulled in under what I call false pretenses. You know, I was talking to the attorney, and I said, am I for the defense? And they said, yes, you're for the defense, all right? What I didn't understand was, or initially that is, this was a, uh, it, this was in the prison system and the person, the patient was incarcerated. And ultimately I was defending the prison system and they had an independent contractor optometrist that they wanted to heap all the, all the blame on. Now, this was the record. I've redacted the names, but you know, as you count it up, there was about 13 words here. 
I don't know if you want to go 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 into trial or be sued with a record that only has 13 words on it. But one word was very important. And it's this one, follow up, ophthalmology, evaluate OS, and then there is a word there. Can anybody tell me what that word is? If you want to put it in the chat, you can put it in the chat. Greg, if you want to take a look at that, see if anybody is, is participating or playing. Nothing in the chat. No questions at this time. No one putting any words in, but I'll keep an eye out. Well, Greg, let me ask you, can you tell me what that word is? Uh, I can't see what the last word is. Follow up, ophthalmology, evaluate, left eye. Uh, I can't tell. Nope, can't tell. Well, I was, able, I was able to ferret it out what it was. The word's macula. Now, in a prison system, it's not like normal practice. I've actually worked in a prison before as an independent contractor earlier in my career. And it's not like if you write a script, you know, they can't take it to the pharmacy and get it filled. Everything has to be ordered through the prison system, and everything had to be approved by a medical director who was usually an internist. And I know that if I prescribed something that was not on a formulary or there was a question, I would get a call from the medical director for clarification and said, well, can anybody tell me what that word is? They said, no. Well, did your medical director know what that word was? No. Did your medical director call the optometrist? No. Okay, there you go. You should settle this because that was the medical director's responsibility. The optometrist you know, can't, can't send him down the retinal specialist down the street. You know, he did what he could do. It was there. But when you get right back to it, do you really want to face a malpractice suit with 13 words on your chart? The answer is you don't. So, Joe, we had so, people weigh in. We had yeah. people say ASAP, and then we had macula, macula, and then we had immediately yep. macula, macula, mm -hmm. macula, 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 macula. Good, very good job, guys. And the reason we can read is we know what it's supposed to say. We've got enough. We we have enough experience that we should know, you know, what that word could be, and it, it, it makes sense. But an internist shouldn't know that word. So, if you don't know it, you reach out and ask. Now we're going to go into our next part, what I call optometric malpractice fact or fiction. So what is malpractice? It's a dereliction of professional duty or failure to exercise an ordinary degree of professional skill or learning by one, such as a physician or attorney or CPA, rendering professional services, which results in a permanent injury, loss, or damage. It's an injurious, negligent, or improper practice. Now, I'm going to talk about my experience and what I've learned through all this as an expert witness. And I don't know how many cases I've done, probably about 100 at this point. When I get the post, it's always adversarial. You know, I've got to be able to handle an advers adversarial situation because when I'm deposed, I'm treated only marginally better than the uh, optometrist who's being sued. I think for me, it's important to be fair and objective. If a patient's been wronged, I think they deserve redress. And if they, uh, but I don't want to see a doctor suffer for what it would have been the ultimate outcome of a disease process. And it's important to be balanced. When I'm deposed, there's a series of questions I I'm going to be asked that I have to answer. Question is, have you ever done this before? The answer is yes. Has your Opinion been disqual discredited or disqualified in a court of law? The answer is no. Do you advertise your services in any legal journals? The answer is no. Do you do you charge a fee uh, for your services? The answer is yes. Do you keep the fee that you charge? The answer is no. My wife gets it and she spends it. And then they're going to ask, what for what side do you testify? And if I would ever say, I only testify for defense, so I only testify for plaintiff. I could be portrayed as being biased. The vast majority of what I do is in defense. I do take plaintiff's cases. There have been situations where I've taken plaintiff's cases. I've looked and I said, there is no case here. This should not move forward. And I've also taken cases where I've reviewed the record and say, I cannot support the care that was given. Uh, I think this should settle. I'm, and I, I'm going to uh, uh, leave the case. 
This is not high courtroom drama. The errors must be of galactic proportions, or somebody has to be dead or blind. This is done with education. Cases are investigated, they're assessed, and they're arbitrated, and many of these will settle. Very rarely do they go to uh, go to trial. I've been to trial before, but it's not common. Mostly what I'm doing is educating somebody in the, the attorney or somebody in their office about the facts of the case. Attorneys don't know the I. Their words, not mine. I was on a plane reading a deposition. I happened to be sitting next to an attorney. Saw what I was doing, so he engaged me in conversation. And at, at the end, he said, wow, I've never heard of an eye case. I didn't think they exist. There's no money in the eye. They don't like taking eye cases. There's a lot of work. They know heart attack. They know cancer. They know stroke. They know kidney disease. They don't know the eye. But they will get good. They will learn it. And, you know, I, I've worked with attorneys. I think you probably part, passed part two of our boards. Now, common errors as an expert witness is trying to win the case. Huge mistake. You're not trying to win the case. You're trying to give unbiased opinion and education and information. One of the active cases I have right now is the, the optometrist has allegedly missed, uh, missed a retinal, retinal tear that led to a retinal detachment. Now, the first visit, the patient was examined properly, scleral depression was done, everything was fine. Then the patient was reappointed uh, for a reasonable time. Patient came back earlier for what was ostensibly a chemical keratitis. Patient had a, had a like painting business or pressure washing business, something where something may have gotten into the eye. So the optometrist sees a patient in follow-up before the routine follow-up for the PVD and, uh, and doesn't dilate. Now, later on, the patient uh, you know, develops a retinal detach attachment and the optometrist is being sued. Now, it's a he said, he said, she said. The patient claims that they went in there for increased symptom for the PVD. The optometrist claims the patient came in for a chemical keratitis and I told the attorney, so look, in, in, in deposition, I'm going to be asked the question, should a patient who has a chemical keratitis necessarily be dilated? And I'm going to say no. Okay, not, I, that, because that's what I believe. And, so, and then I'm going to be asked by the plaintiff's attorney, suppose, doctor, the patient claimed that they had increased symptoms of floaters, increased floaters, and increased flashes. Should that patient be dilated? And I told the attorney, I said, I'm not going to equivocate. I'm not going to ham. I'm not going to ha. Well, maybe it depends. Well, sort of. I'm going to say yes. Because any reasonable PA will find something I published that says that person should be dilated. I'm, I'm going to say yes. I'm not going to try. It's not my job to win your case. It's your job to make your client more credible than the patient. I will give you the facts. I will give you information. I'm not going to win the case for you. You need it. Worst thing I see is when, when people start equivocating, they know the right answer, but they don't want to say the right answer because it's going to hurt the case. You're not, it, it, the expert is, is not going to win the case. Not going to lose the case. Not going to win the case. The attorneys are going to do it. That's their job. And think that you must go all the way through. I've been just summarily dismissed because I wouldn't tell the company line. Just because I'm hired doesn't mean I'm going to go through. And, and, and you know, once I read the read the charts, if I don't if I don't believe in the case, and whenever I look at these, I ask myself, well, if I was on the other side, what would I say? The answer must be the same. It doesn't matter for whom you're working, it must be the same answer. Patient considerations. Some patients have been legitimately wrong, and they deserve redress. Some patients are just angry. Sometimes they're angry at their, their own um, malfeasance or, or, or their own negligence or looking to blame somebody. I will say the economy does enhance malpractice claims. I've seen that uh, through recessions. And patient depositions are mind-numbingly boring. 
but it's an assessment factor. They'll ask things uh, uh, about, you know, does your ear ever itch? When your ear itches, do you scratch it? Do you scratch it with your right hand or your left hand? It's an assessment factor. Also, they want to get the patients to be very detailed about what their loss is and what they can't do. Because more likely than not, by the time that deposition has occurred, that patient has been under surveillance by a private investigator, and they have video of what the patient can and can't do. So private investigators are not just for philandering husbands. They're, they're used in these cases. Common patient complaints, vision loss, fear loss, loss of ability to normal, lead a normal life, constant dizziness from vision loss, intractable headache from vision loss. Uh, Chasey came to me a little while ago. It was the plaintiff's attorney who wanted me to pine against the doctor. And I declined. And I said, look, I don't know the doctor, but, you know, practice a little too close to where I am. Very good chance I could run into this person at, at a meeting. I, 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 I choose not to. And the attorney is very nice. I said, I understand. And he also told him, I said, but, but if the if the defense calls me, I'll probably take the case. She said, okay, I understand. You know, that's fair. But I said, I'm going to give you some unsolicited advice. He goes, what is that? I said, is your patient complaining? What is, is your patient complaining of headache because of the visual? Yeah, he's got constant headache. I said, your client is lying. He is lying to you. There is no, there is no, I mean, every juror can understand dizziness and headache. Every, every juror has been dizzy and had a headache. There is no medical substrate where you lose you, you lose vision in an eye that you have intractable head, or you lose visual field that you have an intractable headache. This is, anybody tells you that, they are lying. So if you're sued for malpractice, the plaintiff's attorney will have an expert witness, an ophthalmologist that hates optometry. Is that fact or fiction? Guys, put it in the chat room. Is that fact or is that fiction? What do you think? We'll take just a wee little pause here, Greg, while they while they weigh in. Okay. That is totally fine. Is anybody I giving am, me anything? I am in the chat room right now. Nothing's rolling in, but I'll watch. Oh, here we go. They're starting to roll in now. Fiction, 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 fact, 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 fiction, fiction, Excellent. fiction. Someone said fact, right. F-A-T. Uh I think they meant fact. No uh, worries. Uh, fact. Let, let me it's just a good mix, you. Joe. It's a nice mix. It's fiction. Ophthalmologists don't make good expert witnesses in optometric malpractice cases. They have to. They have to sign an affidavit that they are intimately familiar with the training of op optometrists, and they're intimately familiar with the standard of practice of optometry. Most can't do that. What they need is another optometrist as the expert witness. Great. It brings me to polling question number two. If an attorney thinks there's been negligence, he or she can sue you for malpractice. Is that fact or fiction? Okay. Opening up the question now. Is it going? Uh, the question is open. So remember, everyone, down if you're having, I believe that's how it works. If you go to polls. They're rolling in. So if an attorney thinks that there has been negligence, he or she can sue for malpractice, fact or fiction. I'm going to wait to uh, start rolling in. Okay, I'm going to display it. And there we go. We have 73% that have said fact. We have 27% that have said uh, fiction. Excellent. Well, guys, it's fiction. They just can't sue you for malpractice. They have to have a medical professional look at the case and make a determination of whether or not there is an issue here. Now, here's a caveat. If an attorney is sniffing around for a case 
and they request they formally request your records. They usually do it with a subpoena, and they ask, and they usually give you a limit of like about ten days. Make sure you send it complete within that time, because if a formal request for records comes out and you don't send them, then they no longer need a medical professional to sue you. Otherwise, they have to have somebody do that. Now, personally, what I believe, legally, the person who is, is looking at this initially to say yes or no should not be able to be hired as the expert witness because there's a financial remuneration involved and there is a, a benefit for them to say yes. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Now here, here, here's a case where I, I was the person who was asked to look into this. Is there a case? This is a plaintiff's case. Malpractice has not been filed yet. They want to see if they can do it. Patient's being treated for glaucoma. Has a history of ocular histoplasmosis syndrome years earlier with a cortical neovascular membrane, had been treated with a, an, an injection of a vasto. Now, the patient had moderate cupping, pressure of 22 and 24 on one visit. Now, personally, glaucoma diagnosis to me is a little dodgy, but I wasn't there. Okay, I wasn't there. But over the course of care, patient develops advancing field loss, then vision, then acuity loss over about a six-month period. Gets referred to an ophthalmologist, who then refers to a retinal specialist, who then refers to a neuro-ophthalmologist, who diagnoses an optic nerve sheath meningioma. Patient and family very angry. Isn't this the slam dunk mal malfeasance case we always hear about? Oh my, to, to be treating something for glaucoma, it's an optic nerve tumor. Well, I asked the attorney, never worked with it before. I said, do you want my opinion? Do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? Yeah, you know, and and this is and this is my litmus test based upon what they say tells me if I'm going to work with this person or not. And she knows very little about that. She says, no, 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 I want your opinion. I don't want to get involved in this. So there's nothing here. I want to know what your opinion is, the facts. Don't just tell me what I want to hear. Okay. The facts as I see them. Patient has multiple diagnoses. Glaucoma, you know, he, a little dodgy, but you, 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 you can't convince a, a jury that that was wrong. Has histoplasmosis previously, has retinal vision loss. Now, optic nerve sheath meningioma is less than 2% of all orbital tumors, and orbital tumors are pretty uncommon. So it's a small number of a small number. You need to convince a jury that this prudent optometrist should have twigged off on something that is exceedingly rare. There is some delay in diagnosis, about six months. Would it make a difference? Bad thing happens to the optic nerve. The optic nerve doesn't recover very well to insult. And I explained to her, he said, okay, thank you very much. We're, 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 I'm not going to file suit. Done. Now, someone else, maybe a lesser person would say, oh, yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't miss this. This was clear negligence because now a suit gets filed, that person gets retained, and they get paid. Yeah. They're, these are my facts. They're, they're, you, you can't push this one in front of a jury. And I, I told him that. Another case, same thing. I'm, I'm asked to make to opine as to whether they can they can they can file a lawsuit. Patient has flashes and floaters on a Monday, gets examined, PVD, educated, has more symptoms on Saturday. Optometrist sees the patient on Sunday. Patient has a retinal detachment. Now, I'm sure this was a walk in the office. Hey, I know you. Let me get you real dilated real quick. And somewhere in the ear said, oh, crap, you have a retinal detachment by the, that's what the optometrist said. I'm sure he said that. Now, he didn't record the encounter at all. He just walked in, dilated patient, looks, uh, you got a retinal detachment. So seen Monday by a retinal specialist, patient is, is nothing by mouth. So obviously the exam happened. How, how Otherwise, how would the patient know not to eat? Had a cert surgical repair. Patient's angry. Seeks an attorney, wants to sue. I'm asked to opine against the optometrist. Now, this is a good example of how it should be done. I'm going to mag it up a little bit. I'm going to read some things to you. Patient, a lot of floaters, yada, yada, yada. Okay. We got a pressure here. We, got, we have color vision here. Not really necessary. Patient was OU, 
dilation, 1% midriosol, 2.5% 2, 2 uh, neosinephrine, dilated BIO 2090. And we take a look here. What you know? What what do we see here? Incomplete PVD attached at periphery. Now it really kind of belong kind of belongs down here. I actually just noticed it, but very detailed lens use, drug use, what he saw, very very detailed. Um, so the facts as I see them, everything in this chart very clearly. Dilation, meds, lenses used, good description of condition. No charting for the visit, but you know he reported NPO on Monday, so the exam did happen. There was a change in symptoms consistent in the literature. So I asked the attorney, do you want my opinion? Let me tell you what you want to hear. Again, my litmus test. He said, no, I, I, I want to know. I, I don't want to go through this if there is no case here. He said, look, based upon what I see, the description, the record, uh, in all medical probability, there was not a tear at the time of the initial exam. He didn't miss anything. So thank you very much. I'm going to encourage the patient not to move forward. Done. Bad outcome versus malpractice. Optometrist sees a 60-year-old female. Yeah. We do have uh, a question, or we have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is when you were back, I believe, talking about sending the records and doing that uh, part, it said... Yeah. Would you send the original or a copy? Copy, 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 copy. The, the, the original is yours. But do not, under any circumstance, make any changes at all. If you think that this is a medical legal issue, you get summons for, you get subpoenas all the time. Don't worry about that. But if you really think that's it's what it is, have somebody else copy it. Put your hands in your pocket or behind your back and just watch them do it to make sure it is thorough and complete. Is that it, Craig? Uh, the next question is, is a meningioma of the optic sheath yes. operable? Uh, poor, poorly so. You can still, you, you, it can be removed, but I don't think that you're going to get visual recovery. And that was all very pertinent. And you are all caught up. All right. So 60-year-old female, pressure was 47. He labeled her glaucoma suspect, started treating her topically. Manager for two years, gets pressure down to the low to mid-20s. Based upon insurance, goes to an ophthalmologist. On multiple medicines, pressure is in the mid-20s, doesn't like it. He changes the medicine. Pressure goes a little bit lower, doesn't like it. He does trabeculoplasty, then trabeculectomy. Patient sues the optometrist. I was retained by the patient's attorney to opine against the optometrist. Now, here are the allegations, and this is the basis of the, of the malpractice case. Detected elevated ILP and only used topical medicines. Diagnosed glaucoma, failed to warrant serious nature. Diagnose, failed to diagnose optic nerve injury. Failed to treat optic nerve injury. Failed to refer to ophthalmologist. Now, I'm looking at this, and this is all pretty limp. This, this 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 to me is, is is very flaccid. It's very limp. Nothing here. Detect the elevated pressure. Only use topical. So that's what we do. That's what most people do. Diagnose glaucoma. Failed to warn serious nature. He said, she said, I can work with that. Failed to diagnose and treat optic nerve injury. The attorney didn't realize that optic nerve injury and glaucoma were the same thing. He thought they were, they were two different diseases. And failed to refer to ophthalmologists, and I explained that in this state, there is no obligation for him to do this. And the, the attorney was shocked. And the reason the attorney was shocked was I, I saw the records. In the, in the first visit with the ophthalmologist, it said, saw an optometrist who did not even recommend referral. The if only, oh, if only you'd gotten here, I could have saved you. If only you did this, I could have saved you. Never do the if only. You don't know what happened in another person's office. So to me, there's not much here. Now, let's look at the records. Medications were obviously changed and added, no notation. I have no idea how the patient was started on one medicine on the first visit and on three medicines on the last visit. No CD ratio was recorded for the first year and a half, and when it was, I know it was wrong. A 60-year-old woman with a pressure of nearly 50 does not have 8.2 CD ratio. 
One time a dilated exam was performed, but nothing recorded. No gonial was done. No fields were done. But the frame style, bifocal style, seg height, PD, temple length, AR coding, tint, all charges are all clear. Here's a, here's a here's the recommendation. There's more in the record about the materials than the patient. You're doing something wrong. Say, hey guys, put in the chat. Is this malpractice? Are the allegations now actually accurate? Now you look at the chart. Okay, chat room is open. I'll keep an eye out for it. This is what keeps us uh, interactive and cult Synch adherent. Synchronous virtual. All right, here they come. I'm getting yes, 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 not sure, yes, malpractice, no, no, poor records impede subsequent doctor's care, yes, 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 no, negligence for sure, yes, no, no, yes, <laughs> yeah, that seems bad. All right, I'm going to, we, we, we got a good mix, okay. Okay. Here are the two questions I, I asked myself. If he had done nothing the first day, what would have happened? If he had made no diagnosis, what would have happened? The patient would have gotten much worse. As such, he got about a 50% pressure reduction, which is really not too bad. And what is going to happen to a 60-year-old woman with an advanced disease uh, who has got a pressure of nearly 50 they're going to use all the medicines, do laser, and end up with surgery. It followed the natural history of what I would expect, and that's why I told the attorney. I said, "Look, there's no, there's no mal. I, I don't, I don't feel that mal there is malpractice here." He said, "Thank you very much. And absent a positive recommendation for you, we're we're not going to move forward. So I'm going, we're going to dis we're we're going to drop the case." Which was good because the optometrist the, the, the sometimes had just sold his practice to a new graduate, one of my former students. God, I'm, I'm I'm saying that I'm saying that too many times in these stories. One of my former students, she was employing him, but she never saw the patient. She got sued as well. By the way, your employer will be sued, or if what your employee is, in, if you somebody's employed, they will, you'll get sued as well. Now, because she had never seen the patient, her malpractice carrier refused to cover her. She had no coverage for this incident. Had it moved forward. She would have had to. She would have. She would have had to uh, declare bankruptcy and leave the state. So I mean, he forced gumped his way through this. This is the this is this is not standard of care, but neither his actions nor inactions I can definitively say contributed to this patient's decline. So scuttle that case. Cases of optometric malpractice typically involve obvious negligence or clearly straightforward. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump ahead on this one. That's clearly fiction. <laughs> These are rarely black and white. They're more shades of gray. Howard's retained as a defense expert. Patient had pigmentary glaucoma. Pressure was uncontrolled on a medical regimen. Pressure was 32. Patient didn't like their meds. The doctor completely changed the regimen, stopped, stopped these drugs, started new drugs, and scheduled a six-month appointment. Now, a patient underwent multiple surgeries, ended up with light perception vision, sued two doctors for $2 million each. Now, is this clear black and white? No, I mean, I would like to see a, a pressure check a little bit earlier than that. Uh, six months, you know, maybe a little bit long, but again, this is a hard one, and there it's it's sort of shades of gray. Did, was he completely wrong? Not necessarily. Could he have been a little tighter? Certainly, but it's shades of gray. Hey, some sometimes it is black and white. I was retained as a defense expert. Patient was seen for fifteen years by the same optometrist. Patient lost field and fixation from pigmentary glaucoma. Now, looking at the chart, I'm going to tell you fifteen years. I don't know if I had more than two pages of records. Might have been a little bit more than that. Horribly illegible. I mean, I could not read anything. The CD, like symbol, I had no idea. But what, what I did see was over the course of 15 years, 
the patient went from a pressure of 12 up to about 29 with no evaluation. Sometimes the optometrist bring you back, you know, a month, six months late. If the pressure is lowered, no problem. And, you know, I, I totally try. I can't read these records. Please, I, I need to have a transcription if I'm going to help. So a couple of weeks later, I, I get I get a copy of the same records. And the doctor, in, in his own handwriting, with a red pen now, wrote next to everything in the same illegible handwriting. I said, look, I need a, I need a transcription of this. So I get, I get for, oh, yeah, I get tra a transcription. For 15 years, two pages. I said, look, because he, 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 he realized we're trying to help him. So my my reference said the, the records can't be defended. You try, try to settle this one out. I mean, everything the optometrist wanted the patient to do, patient did, and lost vision from, from a chronic disease. There is no such thing as practicing defensive medicine. Is that fact or is that fiction? Is that going into the chat box? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll watch the chat box. Fact or fiction, there is no such thing as practicing defensive medicine. Okay, fiction, fiction, fact, fiction, 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 a fact. It's a fact. It, it's a fact that you can't practice offensive medicine. The best that you can do is do everything in the patient's best interest, record everything, and practice standard of care. Here's a patient being managed in, in the VA system, couldn't get into the VA doctor, so it goes to a private optometrist, one who doesn't really treat glaucoma. The patient had pigmentary glaucoma. And pressure was 47 because he wasn't using his medicines. He was a non younger, non-compliant patient. So couldn't get him back in the ER, gets him to another ophthalmology center privately, who's is seen three days later, pressure is 21, because his eye hurt and started using the medicine again. So they said, everything is fine. Two months later, stops using the medicine, pressure is 53, comes to see the, optometr the same optometrist. He is less comfortable with this. He refers emergently patients seen the next day. Referred. Defensive medicine, referred. He was sued for $2 million for not referring fast enough. Seen the next day. The reason is when he, you know, he was at the tail end of his career, didn't understand the medical legal system. He, uh, he got the intent to litigate letter and he answered it himself. The worst possible thing. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Not just Perry Mason, it's real. And he said, well, I saw this was an emergency. He kept saying in, in his in his response, emergency, emergency, emergency. The attorney said, well, such an emergency. Why would you wait for a day? Another case of defensive medicine referring the patient out. Patient has a normal exam with an optometrist, complains of headache, double vision, but none of this was addressed. Patient declined field testing. Confrontation fields were normal. Sees another optometrist 10 months later. This was uh, December 9th. He diagnosed papilledema and refers to a retinal specialist, but we don't know what the urgency was. Ultimately, about six weeks later, patient sees a general ophthalmologist who refers stat to the ER. Now, what are the implications? He did refer. I mean, he did make a referral, maybe to the wrong person. We don't know what the uh, what the what the duration or, or the urgency was. So this was uh, this was actually looking very badly for him. I'm just, I'm just going to go through here real quick. Optometrists in commercial practices are more likely to be sued for malpractice than doctors in private offices. Obviously, that's fiction. I only put that in here because I was talking about this some time ago, and, and a younger optometrist asked, you know, if I'm in a private office, is this, is this not going to happen to me? The answer is no, it can always happen. The majority of optometric malpractice involves inappropriate use of therapeutics. Is that fact or fiction? That also is fiction. The three main offenders of optometric malpractice, failure to detect retinal detachment, failure to detect glaucoma, and failure to detect tumor. These are acts of omission, not commission. Not that you did something wrong, you just didn't do something right. 
Now, my experience up and coming is alleged mismanagement of keratitis. That is an act of commission. Now, this is fair to listen to the patient, fair to observe the signs, fair to make the diagnosis fit the findings instead of the other way around, fair to do the appropriate tests and follow up and fail to make the proper referral. 47 year old male complains of hazy vision in his left eye. Seen by an optometrist 16 months earlier who diagnosed microesotropia 2025 vision. Seen by another optometrist six months later who diagnosed microesotropia and dry eye, same acuity, but the patient still is complaining of their hazy vision. I think we all know amblyopes don't complain about hazy vision. Now vision is diminished down to 2070 with an afferent pupillary defect and these visual fields. So here's a patient uh, who probably long-standing had a chiasmal mass. Fair to the appropriate tests and follow up. What, what could have, should have been done? Facial field tests. When in doubt, run a field, run an OCT, macula and optic nerve. Fair to make the proper referral. Who's the best referral? Anybody else who can lay another set of eyes on the case and make an opinion. Fair to observe the sign. 16-year-old comes in for contact lens finney, refraction, plus one minus 120, 40 acuity, plus 75 minus a half, 20, 20 acuity. Fundus is recording within normal limits. That's all that was written, no CD ratio. Diagnose refractive amblyopia, right eye, and fit with contact lenses, specifically refractive amblyopia. And I think we can all see that is not an amblyogenic factor. At two-week follow-up, his visual acuity is 2100 and good fit is recorded. And I will tell you, this is the entirety of the visit for that day. One month follow-up, 2200 vision is seen, but it's still a good fit. And this is the entirety of the record. Patient's discharged. Comes back for an annual exam. Everything's unchanged. Now 2400. Fundus is still within normal limits. That's all that's written. New lenses were ordered. They were dispensed. Patient said, not really clear in the right eye. Are these the right lenses? Another doctor in the practice picks up an ophthalmoscope, sees a retinal attachment. My recommendation, try to settle. I think I was defending the case. I said, look, try, try to get a settlement. On, try, try, to, try to settle this one out. He watched the ship sink on his watch. Fair to make the diagnosis fit the findings. 58-year-old female wakes with pain, photophobia, lacrimation. Previous exams were normal. Has corneal edema and punctate epitheliopathy in the right eye. Diagnosed with chemical teratitis. History very weak. Didn't get anything in the eye. But had cleaned the house a day and a half earlier and said, well, you probably got fumes in the eye. But I felt fine afterwards. Well, you, you probably got it. It probably just built up. So he treats her with Tobradex. The history is not there. The history is being forced. Don't force the history. Listen and let them tell you. It looked like a chemical keratitis. Ergo, it must be chemical keratitis, even though the history wasn't there. She gets worse, seeks a second opinion in the ER. Pressure is 58 from acute angle closure. Fair to the appropriate tests and follow-up. Well, should have done a pressure. With pressure, maybe go on the ostrich. You know, I think I, I think I may have been defending this course, and, or or I'm not sure if I was defending the case or not. I said this is one that needs to settle. That this this is a hard one to defend. Fair to order the proper test or referral. Fifty eight year male with vision loss, diagnosed uh, with arteritic with with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in both eyes, mild headache and pharyngitis. OCT was ordered uh, ordered, and said rate C-reactive protein and platelets were recommended, but were not ordered. OCT performed. OCT interpreted disc swelling the right eye, more so on the left. Uh, at that point, the optometrist, this is on a, this is on a Saturday, you know, has, has uh, maybe a come to the Lord moment, faxes to the PCP serology ASAP, office is not open. Sunday, nothing happens. Monday, the message of red serology and carotid test is setting for the following Wednesday evening. Patient wakes up, profound vision loss in the other eye, walks into the ER, gets a test. Everything's elevated. He had temporal arteritis. You know, sometimes you just shake your head. I'm retained for, I was retained for the defense. Diabetic patient sees an optometrist who diagnosed proliferative diabetic retinopathy in each eye. 
educates and warns risk of permanent blindness, must see retinal specialists within seven days. Now, unfortunately, because of insurance, I think I think this was a a, a Valentine's gift to this woman from her boyfriend of, of an eye exam. This optometrist was not in her in her insurance network, thus could not make a referral. So the patient had to go back and see another optometrist in the network to make the referral. So six weeks later, sees another optometrist who details a completely normal examination. Several months later, patient is now completely visually impaired from proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So I was asked to opine and defend the optometrist. I, I totally turned. So look, this is great. Yeah. So all the optometrists diagnose PDR, risk permanent blindness, must see retinal specialist within seven days. Maybe a little heavy handed, but look, it's all there. Now this is easy to defend. And he goes, No, it's the other guy. Do you want to take the case? I said, No, thank you. Sometimes you shake your head, part two. I was asked to defend an optometrist allegedly who, admit, who mis, mis, misdiagnosed pseudo exfoliative glaucoma. Attorney calls me, says, uh, You know, I've got a case, exfoliative glaucoma. Will you take a look at the case and see if you want to take it for the defense? I said, Sure, I'm happy to look at the record. So the first thing I got was an affidavit to sign that says there is no evidence of glaucoma at this time. So I contacted the attorney and said, I'm happy to sign it if there's no evidence of glaucoma at this time. I'm not sent, signing it until I see the records. So he said, please send me the records. And they sent me the records. And these photographs were in there of a 0.95 cup to disc ratio in each eye. And I said, unfortunately, there was evidence of glaucoma being present at this time. I say they probably had less uh, less less ev le less evidence uh, at the OJ trial. Going to diagnose retinal detachment. Fifty-year-old male sees flashes and floaters. Goes to his optometrist, who dilates and performs BIO. He sees no breaks, no detachments. Records as such. Warn signs, symptoms, retinal detachment. Reappoints the patient in a reasonable time, and dismisses the patient. Now, patient has worsening of symptoms and vision loss a week later. Telephones the optometrist, who immediately directs the patient to a friendly retinal specialist, but doesn't put this in the chart. Um, don't worry about pulling the question here, Greg. I don't think I have one. So, you know, he's he's out to dinner with his wife. His answering service calls me, calls the patient, he hears the story, said, Look, I want you to go see this doctor tomorrow. Uh, and he goes back, you know, goes back to dinner, goes to the office the next day, forgets all about this, doesn't put this conversation in the chart. Patient now has a retinal detachment with a poor surgical outcome. Sues the optometrist for malpractice. Is this malpractice? Was the standard of care breached? Greg, we're going to hear a polling question here, if you don't mind. That's perfect. Anything not recorded? While the question, go ahead and I'll let you do that in a second. While you're doing the poll, we have a question for you. All right. Anything not recorded in the patient is considered not performed. Is that fact or fiction? What's the question, Greg? Okay. So I wanted to launch the poll. Let me go back to mm -hmm. the chat here. Okay. If you're not doing labs, do you send the patient to the ER if you suspect temporal arteritis? Yes. If you if, if you're sniffing around in an older person with a headache or a little scalp pain, but no vision loss, I either order the labs myself or you can ask the primary care physician. I would not send that to the ER. If they come in with gangbuster history and ischemic neuropathy in one eye, the answer is yes, that goes to the ER. Okay. Are good photographs enough with PBD symptoms or is dilation required with no flashes? Uh, dilate. An acute PBD should be dilated. Standard of care is what would other people do? I think most people, most prudent optometrists would dilate. So the answer is it should be done. So what does our polling question say? Greg, is that fact or fiction? Well, give me one second. If nothing okay. was performed... How did he know to go to the surgeon? Well, that's exactly it. How... 
Hmm? Yeah, that, that that's that's very pertinent. That that comment is very pertinent. Okay, so let me see if we have. Uh, yes, we've had uh, about thirty some people reply. I'm going to display it. I'm figuring out the system. Now they can see it. Uh, oop, what happened? We have 95%, but 91% that have said fact. It is fiction. Not written, not done is not true. Information can come out other places. It comes out in deposition in other people's record as the person made a comment if if that event didn't happen how do you know to go to the surgeon that is very important in fact it ended up in the patient you know, in the in, in the retinal specialist chart it said it said come, told him come to see me there it is it's in there what you want don't ever want to do is try to change a record after the fact now could have optometrists have missed a break yeah could have been a break not detectable to a good retinologist sure could one have been not there initially informed after the exam yes so in my opinion it's, it's a bad outcome but it's not malpractice and and i was asked to opine for the patient against the doctor and i went to the attorney and said look he met the standard of care there's no malpractice here well the attorney says i've got another optometrist who will swear in a stack of bibles this is malpractice my response well give him a call because i'm not going to do it even for, and he tells me the figures that I'm going to, not a bribe, but what I'm going to bill for my services at trial. And my response is, no, thanks. And I was summarily fired and happily so. But I did read all the records, and this I thought was very interesting. The friendly retinologist was deposed. And they asked the friendly ret retinologist, could this doctor have missed the retinal break? And, you know, he said, yeah, yes, it's likely he did. He's not a physician, you know. Now, I used to always ask, does this bother anybody out there? And it may, it may get your neck up, but don't let it. And the reason is, it's they're looking for a legal pot of gold. What they need, the attorney need, is they have, an, as an expert witness, I'm being paid for my opinion. They need somebody else in that case who rendered care, who's not being sur sued, to apply or say something negative against you. That's just it. I mean, that's that's what that's that's what they want to do, and they're very good at doing this. Depositions are adversarial. You need they're very good at getting someone to say something untoward. I'm going to give you another retinal specialist perspective. Another case, di different patient, different doctor, different retinal specialist. Verbatim. This is verbatim out of the deposition. Do you think you as a medical doctor, as an ophthalmologist, is better trained and equipped to rule out or rule in a retinal attachment than an optometrist? Answer, I think optometrists are trained or supposedly trained in their field to be able to do a dilated funds exam to diagnose retinal tears or attachments as well as any other eye care professional. Now, going for the ego, you believe an optometrist has the same expertise and ability to diagnose a retinal attachment or retinal tear as you do? response setting my ego aside i said optometrists are trained to evaluate the peripheral retina as well as an ophthalmologist and that's my answer it takes a lot of fortitude to do this you know i was opining in a case defending optometrists who allegedly missed angle closure they had an op a treating ophthalmologist opining said yeah he, he didn't really do a very good job but then again you know I might have done the same thing, or I might have misinterpreted, like he they stepped all over himself and really ended up helping the optometrist. In another case, the optometrist sued for infectious keratitis. I was defending, but they wanted a corneal specialist involved, and she was friendly with a corneal specialist and got him hired. And and he never had done this, was scared out of his mind, ended up saying things that really kind of hurt the case when he was trying to help. You know, sometimes it's black and white or worse. 55 year old mayor with a weed gets a weed whacker abrasion, high speed impact, sees two optometrists who, between them, diagnose a shallow chamber, a pressure less than five, and a hypopia. End result was a penetrating injury and endophthalmitis, and the patient lost, uh, lost his vision. I can tell you that in this case, I, I was asked to opine on this. 
And I told the attorney in defense, I told the attorney I was not really interested because it sounded pretty bad. He said, we at least look at the records. I said, sure, I'll look at the records. So I look at the records and the records are worse than he even told me. So he asked me if I, when, I, in, when he consulted, if I would, if I would take the case and I said, I prefer not to. He said, well, you know, I've got it in good authority that you publicly stated doctors are allowed to make mistakes. And I said, yeah, you're right. I did say that. So he, he ropes me into the case to defend them. And our defense was they made a mistake. They had misdiagnoses, but they followed their misdiagnoses to their conclusions. It was just a misdiagnosis. And I can tell you, in deposition, they hammered me for about 20 minutes trying to get me to say negligent or below standard of care by not thinking of endophthalmitis. And after about 20 minutes, I just rope a dope. They pounded and pounded on me and realized I was never going to say that. And they just moved on. All I know is it was settled and everybody was happy. But I can tell you, there were seven professionals in, involved in this case that said they fell below the standard of care because they didn't see a self-sealing corneal perforation. And I've heard that so many times. In all medical probability, the retinal break, corneal perforation, whatever it was, was present at the time of your examination. And because you failed to see and diagnose it, you fell below the standard of care because the standard of care dictates you would have seen and diagnosed it. And because you didn't see and diagnose it, you were negligent. Now, I don't know what you all think about this, but this is what I think about this. It is that. <laughs> Here is the law. This is what would be read to a jury prior to deliberations in a malpractice. Negligence refers to a patient's failure to follow a duty of conduct impo imposed by law. Every healthcare provider is under a duty to use their best judgment in the treatment and care of their patient, to use reasonable care and diligence in the application of skill and knowledge to patient care, and to provide health care in accordance with the standards of practice among members of the same health care profession with similar training and experience situated in the same or similar communities at the same time the health care is rendered. The law does not require a provider absolute accuracy in their practice or judgment, does not hold you to a standard of infallibility or expect you to have the utmost degree of skill and learning known only to a few in the profession, only that a health care provider has used those standards of practice exercised by members of the same health care profession with similar training and experience situated in the same or similar communities at the time the health care is rendered. Absent, uh, a health care provider does not guarantee the correctness of the diagnosis, analysis, judgment, or outcome. And absent such a guarantee, which we would never give, a health care provider is not responsible for a mistake in their diagnosis, analysis, judgment, unless they violate the duty described above. This is the law. Not that stuff was well, there's probably a retinal break there and because you didn't see it, you were negligent and fell below the standard of care because standard of care dictates you would find it. That is garbage. This is the law. I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over this one, Greg. We never make a late amendment to a chart. You know, patient initiates a, a case against the optometrist for vision loss from diabetic retinopathy. First attorney gets disinterested, drops the case. A second attorney gets retained, gets an amended record from the optometrist. I was retained as a defense uh, expert. Now, what would happen if that second attorney got, got a copy of the record from the first attorney and saw they were different? You'd never make a change. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, now that's different than, you know, that's the record was detained and then you went back and you adjusted it but you know i know there's times whenever i'll go and you know oh geez I, you know i forgot to put document that i called this retinologist and spoke to them um after hours so i sent the patient spoke to the retinologist and then went in the next day and you can uh, you can amend the record that way can you not mm -hmm. yes you can but be transparent here's an example of one case that i did I, I reviewed and amended on 226 in full knowledge. The original chart was given to the patient on 225 so she can obtain necessary referrals. 
I acknowledge there'll be some differences in the wording in this chart compared to that given the patient due to the urgent nature. Can't argue with it. I'm going to skip ahead. Here's a case, because th 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 there's something I want to get to, Greg, that I just never get to. I'm going to skip ahead and make sure I, 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 I get it. I call okay. this one a festival of ignorance. 37-year-old female undergoes pterygium surgery, gets referred from a top optometric office to an ODMD uh, referral center for pterygium surgery, successfully done. Patients put in Pred Forte postoperatively. One day follow-up, everything's good. One week follow-up, everything is great. Patients referred to the optometrist. Three, three weeks later, goes to the optometrist, complaining of some blurred vision, not really well described or diagnosed. Now, no pressure was taken. She still calls in, still having some blurred vision. Another optometrist in the practice said, look, patient was just seen yesterday. Get him in. Uh, just have, get, him, get him in, get him dilated. Let me take a quick look. Gets dilated. See the swollen optic nerve. Tries to refer to neurology. Can't get him in. Tries to get referred to neuro ophthalmology. Can't get him in. But she also doesn't check the pressure. Patient was just in on emergency where the tech just walked him in and dilated the patient. She did get him to a retinal specialist the same day. Now, the retinal specialist is working under the assumption that this is optic neuritis because she's 37 years old. She's got a swollen optic nerve. She has some discomfort. Well, he also, he measures pressure. It's 49.5, not 49, not 50, 49.5. He gets an emergency MRI, which is normal because it's not optic neuritis, but he still diagnoses optic neuritis and he diagnoses steroid-induced pressure rise for which he treats by injecting a steroid in the eye because he thinks Injectable steroids treats optic neuritis, which is incredibly incorrect. All three were sued for missing steroid-induced glaucoma. Does any glaucoma cause a swollen optic nerve? The answer is no. She had a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. I know this because I saw the case. I wrote a five-page dissertation. Nobody even considered a diagnosis until I weighed in. But the plaintiff expert witness, who is an ophthalmologist, actually said these things. This is from his deposition. Any delay in treatment was significant because glaucoma progressed at an unusually rapid rate. And even an hour delay led to the deleterious outcome. No glaucoma progresses by the hour. Disc power is common in glaucoma. We know that's not true. Glaucoma commonly occurs with small cups. We know that's not true. AION does. When the IOP is very elevated, it often causes a swollen nerve. I've never seen that in my entire career. And you never consider ischemic neuropathy in a patient under the age of 70. I actually asked the attorney to give me a copy of this guy's CV because I want to make sure he actually went to medical school because I doubt it. I'm going to jump ahead, Greg. That's fine. Because something I really want to get to, which we never get to, is how to survive the deposition. Is there anything I should address first? Uh, nothing's in the chat box. I thanked everyone for participating. Uh, that helps with the synchronous part. And you are caught up. And I'm going to close my polls down. I, I think... can tell you, I, I, I get too ambitious on this lecture. Uh, there's, there's so much to get through. I've had so many cases. I want to talk to everybody out there. If this ever happens to you, how to survive the deposition. If you, ever you are highly, highly unlikely ever to be sued for malpractice. That being said, if you see as much as one patient, the potential is there. I want to give you some clues to what to expect and how to survive a deposition. The most important thing to remember, it isn't personal. It's just business. It's how they make a living. It's devastating to you, but it's just how they make a living. So the question is, am I being sued? You get a subpoena for your records. It doesn't mean anything. Slip and fall, insurance, anything else. Don't worry about that. You're most likely not being sued. But send immediately. We talked about this earlier in case you are getting sued. All right, send it immediately. Just complete and unaltered. Don't worry about subpoenas. Happens all the time. Now, if you get a letter 
a letter that says intent to litigate, you're being sued. If it happens, call me, email me, I'll talk you off the ledge. A couple weeks ago, I got I got messengered on Facebook one of my former students. God, I keep saying that phrase too many times. She's getting sued for malpractice. She needed she needed somebody to talk to. I talked her off the ledge. I will do it to you. If it happens, call me. I'll help you. Now, the notice of intent to litigate letter immediately tries to beat you into submission. It doesn't mention your care or your exam, only your negligence. It will say in the prior to your negligence, as a result of your negligence, was there anything subsequent to your negligence? They're going to beat you into submission. You're going to read that and think that you're, you're going to think you're guilty. Don't respond to this yourself. Contact your insurance company. They'll get you an attorney. But you must be honest. You can't withhold information. You can't in deposition, you know, smugly say, hey, that's not my signature. I wasn't in the office that day. It won't fly. You'll be found in contempt. You have to be. So call the insurance, your insurance company. They'll get you an attorney. It all lies in the depositions. Attorneys representing all parties are going to be involved. There's a court reporter and often a videographer. There's no judge or jury. It's a fact-finding mission. Don't volunteer information. You'll never convince them they're wrong to file suit. Cases aren't won in deposition. They're lost. And insist on home field advantage. They have to come to your office if you want in your office, or they can come to your attorney's office, or they can come to new. You don't have to walk into the lion, lion's den. And if you're being sued, you can attend other depositions. There is a certain intimidation factor that you can exert if you're in somebody else's deposition. Trial, all right, it's not my cousin Vinny. Nobody is rushing through, you know, in the door, waving something, you know, a piece of paper. I've solved the case. You know, that doesn't happen. That's the movies. A trial is a performance. I've been to trial. I've been to trial before. It's nothing more than a performance. The show has been written. It's rehearsed. Hair and makeup. The jury is the audience. There's no smoking gun. Everything comes from the depositions. That's the script of the, of the performance. If it's not in the deposition, it cannot be, it, it, it cannot be entered in trial. Everything comes right off that almost word for word. It's not my cousin busy, Vinny. Nobody is solving the case or saving the day at the last minute. You have to answer, just answer the questions. You have to answer unless you're instructed not to by your attorney. The attorney will object throughout the form, you know, form, form. They're just objecting to how the question is being asked. You still have to answer. Never try to educate the plaintiff's attorney. You might give them some information they, they otherwise don't get asked. And don't try to give great testimony. You'll have your chance in court. Be, be prepared and be professional. Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. A deposition is adversarial. Some attorneys will intimidate you. Some will kill you with kindness. They are the enemy. They want information to be used against you. And always keep up your guard. Depositions are interrogations. I think one of my, for me, a short deposition might be an hour to an, about an hour and a half is short. My last deposition went five hours. Thank God it was on Zoom. And, it, you know, five hours because there, there were weaknesses in the case that nobody thought about. And basically, the attorney started fishing like other medical theories based upon what I was saying. And the attorney uh, who, who, uh, who had hired me, you know, shut it down. I said, "Look, you, you, you can't go fishing here. You ask some questions, but don't don't try to you know don't try to get more information out of here and, and change you know change your approach." But you've always got to keep up your guard. As I tell people, imagine you're driving in the snow, you know, a snowstorm, not a blizzard, but a snowstorm. All right, both hands on the wheel. You're not looking at your car. You're not you're not playing with it. Your high beams are on. You're not paying attention. You're not fiddling with the radio. You're you're paying attention. You're not texting. If you do all that, you're going to survive the drive. Okay. You do that, you're going to be fine. If you get tired, you take a break. You're allowed to take a break. You want to go to the bathroom? You can take a break. The only thing is, if there is a line of questioning, 
the attorney will probably ask that we finish that line of questioning before we take a break. But if you get too comfortable, they know what they're doing. You know, wolves in sheep's clothing. You, you may have the, 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 the sweetest uh, person uh, as an attorney. They are the enemy. If you get comfortable, you might agree to something medically ridiculous. Appearance, demeanor is as important as your testimony. Be neat. Don't get angle, angry. Don't get. Don't condescend. You know, they 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 know very little about optometry. They look at us as failed. They think optometrists are failed physician wannabes. That you know, that that that's their approach. That that's their only strategy. And they will go after your ego. I, I, I was being deposed by an attorney who was also an ophthalmologist. He was an ophthalmologist first, and he went back and became an attorney. And they, they said, you know, now, Dr. South, doctor, you, you, you didn't go to medical school, right? You're, you're, you're not a medical doctor, are you? I mean, they know all of this. They'll, they'll say, you're, you're, you didn't go to medical school. You, you, you're not a medical doctor. And when he said that, I said, oh, no, 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 please, please. No, I, I'm an optometrist. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm, I'm an optometrist. And I said, when I went to optometry school, there were 172 medical schools and only 23 optometry colleges. I got into one of those. No, I'm an optometrist. Please don't insult me. And that was the end of that. You know, nowadays, I think that the, the ratio between medical schools and optometry schools might be a little bit closer. But, you know, I didn't really say that, did I, Greg? We'll, we'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> Joe, oh, when well, you have a chance, yeah. there is a question. So whenever you want. All right. All right. Do it. It says, is there a difference between a subpoena and just a request by mail? Subpoena is, is, is a request by mail could be shared care. A subpoena is a legal document that you must comply with. Now, questions are going to be phrased to make you appear dishonest. You got to be composed and concentrate. You know, they they may be intimidated by, by your resilience. It's not personal. It's just business. I was I was at trial. I was in the you know in the audience. I was waiting for my turn. There's no jury. Attorney comes up, sits next to me. He sees me. He sits next to the, the plaintiff's attorney. I was defending the optometrist. He sits down next to me and he goes, "Hey, good to see you. How are you doing? Good, good to see you. Good to see you. Right, look." Case is what it is, okay? It is what it is. Can't make it more than it is. Um, no hijinks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna go right off your deposition. I'm gonna go word for word off your deposition. And I'm gonna be brief. No hijinks. And there's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it can't make it more than it is. Okay. Joey comes in. I'm in the witness stand. He, he portrays me as the scourge of the profession. He is gesticulating, he's sighing, he's holding his head, he's pounding on the leg. He can't believe he has to deal with the ilk of me. I finish my testimony, I walk off, I walk by him, he goes, hey, good job, you did a good job up there. Yeah, he friended me on Facebook, he connected with me on LinkedIn. It's not personal, it's just business. Know what you're answering. Attorney is not a medical professional. They may ask confusing questions. They ask for it to be repeated or rephrased. Don't be intimidated. You know, there are very few absolutes in life. You, know, you don't get intimidated to give them the answer they want, but you must answer yes or no. You can explain yourself after answering, but you can't start with a soliloquy. It becomes adversarial. You have to say yes or no, and then move on. Red flags, would you agree that? Is it a fair statement that, okay, this is usually preceding a proposition that's too broad to be answered by a simple yes or no. Be careful. These are questions used to elicit material to use against you and think before you speak. Once you speak, it's in the record. Can't, you cannot undo it. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. One at a time, let the attorney finish the question before answering. Make sure you understand the question before responding. A court reporter can only trans transcribe one person at a time. The issue is people talk over themselves. So you, you need your attorney has time to voice objections. And make sure the entire question is accurate before you say yes. If anything is inaccurate or illogical, say no. Sometimes you can't remember. Maybe the facts occurred several years ago. You can always refer to your records during questioning. Everything will be highlighted, annotated, bookmarked. It's not a memory, it's not a memory contest. You will look at your records. Now, what if there's no record or recollection? If you remember something, you can say so. If you don't remember something, you can say so. 
But you can't guess or speculate. In fact, if you use the word speculate, everything after that word will be stricken from testimony. You can't not use the word speculate. Watch what you're answering. Hypothetical questions are posed only to be used against you. Doctor, isn't it, be it, 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 isn't it better to diagnose cancer earlier than later? Sounds pretty good. Well, there are some cancers that are uniformly fatal. That's not a hypothetical that, that will carry all the way through. Sometimes you can't answer a hypothetical. And make sure you agree with everything before you answer. And hey, Jen, let no me just... Rule yeah. Let me just say this to the audience, that the survey is now live. I got a little pop-up. I think you did, too. Um, the survey is live. Uh, that's the post-event survey that can be done. It pops up 10 minutes before. Or you can do it in the email that's coming here shortly. I just wanted to announce that, Joe. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Greg. And there's no rule. You have to have an opinion based upon a hypothetical. It's not a crime to meet with your attorney. You're supposed to meet with your attorney. They may try to intimidate you, thinking that you did something wrong to meet with the attorney. You're supposed to meet with your attorney. And nothing is off the record. Keep your big mouth shut. You may, you know, let's say you you, you haven't started the, the deposition or there's been a break and you're not back, you know, the, recor the, the recording is not started. We're not, you start talking, you feel pretty good. You start talking the, uh, the ball game. Or you go to the bathroom and see, you know, this is off the record, right? Yeah, of course it's off the record until you get back in, in the deposition. That's, but now it's on the record. And tell the truth. There are very few cases that can't be defended on the facts and very few cases that can be defended if the defendant is caught lying. I've been involved in cases like that where the defendant was clearly lying. Now, you will always have your chance to explain yourself in a court of law. You, your guilt or innocence will never be dictated by a chart note. You will always have a chance to explain yourself. Hold to your opinion. They'll try to make it sound like you're lying. If they don't like your answer, they may preface it with, are you telling us under oath? Or is it really your sworn testimony that? They're trying to imply that you're lying. Don't be intimidated. Your answer is your answer. If asked repeatedly, repeatedly gave the same answer, rope and dope, it won't go on long. Your attorney will, will, will shut that down. Prepare, read, skilled attorneys can get competent physicians to agree to medical impossibilities. Once it's said in deposition, it's written in stone. You'll always have a chance to explain yourself in a court of law, you, and you can defend almost anything. In conclusion, risk of malpractice is a low, but is a risk of professional life. If it happens, you will get through it. It's not the end of your life, your practice, your career. And always remember, it isn't personal. It's just business. I know I really picked up the pace, Greg. I hope that I didn't uh, I didn't wear out the audience or come up a, a, as being a, a little bit confusing. But I get so ambitious in this and I probably need to trim it down even a little bit more. So I am going to stop my sharing and say thank you, everybody. That is Medical Legal Issues 101. So I'm going to stop my sharing, Greg. I think we should be good. Yeah, we're perfect. And uh, Joe, I'm looking at the, the question chat box here. I'm not seeing anything rolling in. Uh, oh. What is Joe's contact con, contact information if we should need it? So, Joe, if you want to give that. Yeah. Cell phone is 954-298-0970. 954-298-0970. Two uh, nine eight. What's the last four? 0970. 0970. Can I put it in there? Yep. Joseph at optometricedu.com. Or what a lot of people do is they friend me on Facebook and contact me in Messenger. I'm typing it in for you. So, all right. Well, Joe, this is definitely, you know, an area of expertise, having 100 cases, you know, it's certainly, I've heard this a couple of times, and every time I hear it, it's certainly, I learned something new. Uh, so uh, the questions have all been answered, and I appreciate you uh, giving this lecture and probably easing and helping people understand 
uh, and mitigating these medical mishaps. So great job uh, as 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 usual, but especially in this arena. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. I'm glad to do it. I I, I actually rather rather enjoy doing it. Uh, I find it uh, pretty fascinating, and uh, I always read always ready to help.